Hi, I'm Todd Reingold, the hopeful aspirant. Welcome to another installment of I Got a Testimony. Today, I have my good friend, Brian Lane with me. Brian and I used to work together uh, for a couple of years. He's a really great guy. I always said when we used to talk, you got some amazing stories to tell. So today, he's gonna tell his testimony. So I'm gonna toss it over to Mr. Brian Lane. Brian, how you doing today? Doing all right, Todd, how you doing? Yourself? Good. Started out living with my mom, you know, everything was uh, okay as far as I knew being, you know, being younger or whatnot. Um, and at one time she was caught up in the life and she ended up sending me to my dad. But um, yeah, no, going back, just, just drawing from that, um, like watching my dad, like all of a sudden he's 30 years old and he's had this kid dropped on him. You know, he was just in the middle of just living and just hanging out. But I watched him pull himself together, you know, and he just had, he just told me, he's like, hey, we're gonna figure this thing out together. Um, and that showed me no matter what is going on, the things that matter, matter. You know, a, a lot of dads wouldn't have done that, you know, and I, I got tons of friends whose dads aren't there. They was raised by the mom, but I'm the complete opposite. I was raised by my pops. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, 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 it not only showed me what happens when life throws you a curve, like, hey, we got to pick this thing up and go. But it also showed me that no matter what comes at you, you can always find a way to make it work. By any means, he just made everything happen. I, we didn't have money and we didn't have material things, but we had everything that we needed, you know. And I, it, that kind of stuck with me. It kind of resonated with me because, you know, he was young, I was young, and we kind of grew up together. But he also showed me what it takes to be a man. What do you think are, are some of the major differences talking to your friends through the years and how they grew up and some of the ways their mother raised their mothers raised them? What are some of the contrasts that, that you can think of by having your dad raise you? Well, like I said, number one, it it it, it showed me, you know, it it taught me something that he was man enough to accept his responsibility, even though it was given to him like, you know, boom, here you go. Um, but the contrast to it is as a man, you know, and I know, and a lot of men probably out there know, you know, you, don't, you just don't get a lot of slack as a man. Like you just are, you know, you're just giving it and you're told just to make it work. And my dad made it work. You know what I mean? He didn't run from it. He didn't, he didn't sugarcoat it. If he couldn't do something, he couldn't do it. Right. But he would tell me, you know, he humbled himself and said, son, we can't have that or we can't do that, but here's what we can do. Right. Right. And as you know, I was a stay-at-home dad for a long time and and then, then started working part-time when my son went into kindergarten. So that's always been a like big, big part of my life. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. I really have. I mean, he's a little difficult now, 15, but he'll probably make an appearance at some point because he this is where the food is. It's down here. You know, being a stay-at-home dad and, and seeing that most of the stay-at-home parents were moms. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, nothing against the ladies, but they handle situations very, very differently. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've shared with my audience, I've shared with you, Brian, is you know, I've had pretty acute anxiety disorder for a long time. And, and the last thing I wanted to do was impart that to my son. Now, I do believe it comes through the lineage, and I do believe a lot of it is genetic, that just like alcoholism, I think you're predisposed, but mm -hmm. ultimately it's your environment that determined so you may be predisposed to things but if you are in a very supportive loving environment I think it will mitigate the symptoms the problems mm -hmm. in my family my mother was the paragon of anxiety and neurotic behavior so she raised me and so as far as my environment helping to counter some of what I was predisposed to no I got it full when I raised my son I was so conscious every second of the day to not impart this to him. So mm -hmm. with him being a boy, wanting to climb trees, always wanting to run, throw things. I mean, he was fearless for about three years. Every morning we had a certain routine. I had my dog then too. So I would walk her with, with one arm and then I had him in the stroller. And sometimes he would get out and for a little bit and then he'd come back. But when he would get out, he'd always want to run. And he would run full steam like kids do. And the, other, the ladies that were around with their kids, they would just be horrified. Uh, mm -hmm. that he was running ahead. And 
But at the time, it was like 10 or 11 in the morning. Everyone was at work. There's very little traffic, very little danger. And I said to him, do not go in that road. Stay on the sidewalk. If you if you go in the road one time, then, you know, I'm going to have to really keep you on a tight mm-hmm. loop, so to speak. And I'll tell you, he ran all the way up to the end of that curb, but he never went in the road. And I know that the ladies thought I was crazy. I know that that's one of the reasons that they didn't have their kids come over here. Like we didn't do the play dates that they did. I mean, it was because I was a guy too, but I think my parenting was very different because I was male and I was very determined to not impart the anxiety. But also I didn't like all the hyperbole that I saw the ladies do where they were always yelling at the kids and always saying, no, no, and get back here. And this is so hard. And I said, no. I want to enjoy my time with him and I don't want to constantly yell at him when he really was endangering himself or perhaps someone else. If I said no, I mean, he stopped because it was so rare that I really put that bass in my voice with him. So, you know, the reason I was telling you about that, because I asked you, that's just something that I did as a male. And I think when I see men raising their kids, we don't get as emotional generally, we're not as worried. But yeah, and that's kind of how the way my pops did it. Like we we kind of, it was like on the job training per se. You know what I mean? Like he was learning and then I was learning because I came from a mom and now I'm with a dad. And he went from, you know, not having a kid in the house. And now all of a sudden I got this kid here. Right. So he kind of did that same thing, even though I was 12 years old when I got to him. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, it was just a little bit, it was more of teaching me the man way, I guess, of, of, of doing it, you know, for lack of a better term. It's good to watch a person figure something out. They don't, you know, without blaming other people, he could have blown up and blamed my mom or blamed somebody for whatever, you know, the situation is, but he didn't. Uh, he taught me a lot. Um, he's a big part of my life, you know, a huge part of my life. Um, right. He's my best friend to this day. Like right now, he's my best friend. Other than us looking alike, you know, if you've seen us out in public, you would just think we was two buddies hanging out. You know mm. what I mean? Because we... We did grow up together, but I also respect who he is, you know. Um, you know, I watched my dad cook and clean and do all the womanly things of the house. And he was a man man, you know, and but he was also, you know, he's also mowing the grass and changing oil and fixing pipes and all this other stuff. And I kind of, you know, I seen that. I seen what it takes to be a man. Right. The same thing that I try to, you know, with my with my kids now, like my girls and my boys, is like my job is to show you what a man is supposed to be. That's what matters in the grand scheme of my life, not how many likes I get on Facebook or what all this junk that people just get caught up in. Like, that's what I, you know, and that's what inspires me to continue, you know, to live by the the motto of be better than yesterday. You control what you can control and you worry about what you what what really matters. You know, the times we talked, I mean, the I always really love the stories you tell me about your dad and. I just have a real soft spot for that. I think it's not just because of my relationship with my own son, but it's also because I didn't have the relationship with my father that I really wanted. You know, when you're young and everything's fresh and new, you have a sense that something's not right, but you don't really have the perspective until you get older. He just had a blind spot with me in particular. I've always been, as I say, I'm a different kind of cat and wired differently. And, you know, he kind of did the one size fits all with me. I have that uh, that conflict, you know, of like wishing that my dad had been a little softer with me, wishing he had been a little more mm-hmm. of my friend and not always my my father. And I tell my son, you know, I'm the father I wished I had. I just think it's it's so admirable the relationship you have with your dad because it's like you could have gone a different way with this. It says a lot about you as a person because there are plenty of children that if they're in jail or if they have a drug problem and you sit down with them and you're like, what, what's going on? What happened? Well, you know, I didn't really grow up with my mom and, you know, my dad, you they know, always, yeah, they'll find somebody else to put it on and like, yeah. Oh, and I get it. I mean, and I believe in you are a product of your environment, but I also believe that, you know, things happen and things are put in front of you that can change you, you know, change the way you do things in mind was basketball. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, playing basketball took me away from my hometown. It took me away from being with the family all the time. Cause I'd be gone for, you know, a week, week or so at a time. 
and you just figure it out. And then you realize that like, there's more to, there's more to the world than your little box that you and your family live in, you know? And then you just get to the point where you're like, you know what, there, there's more, I, there's more that can be done. There's more I can do other than just sitting here and just becoming another link in this chain. You know, I'm going to break that link. I'm going to do something different. So with basketball, I'm glad you brought it up. It was definitely something I want to talk about. You you got started, obviously, at a young age, right? Elementary school? And, yeah. And then played up through high school. Now, did you did you get a college scholarship with that? Yes, I did get a college scholarship. Ended up uh, getting injured. So that scholarship got, you know, taken, rescinded or whatever. But, you know, anyway, we got through that. And uh, so <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and again, you know, I go back to my pops and I could have blamed somebody. I could have did all this. I could have did all that. But, you know, I busted my tail, worked my tail off. And I was working in an after school program and had a buddy that got me back like in the basketball. I had been out of school for two years. He got me back in and we got back in shape. And I was actually going overseas to play on a travel team for a month. And the way it worked, if somebody liked you, they could sign you right, sign you right then, you know, to a contract or whatnot. So made that team, made a travel team. We was leaving in August and stepped on a guy's foot in May and broke my foot. So there, wow. was, that. there was that. Yeah. Which it didn't really kill me, like crush me, because I always knew that work was in the cards. You know, basketball was going to end at some point, whether it was, you know, 23 or it was 43 like I, I wasn't going to do that forever right so, you know it worked out and um you know again like I said went back home to my pops and he was just like son it's just the way that's the way it was supposed to be there's nothing you can do about it you can get mad you can get as mad as you want what can you do about it and I'm just like you know it, it's nothing it's the way it works it, it led to a ton of other things that I never thought I'd be doing but you know it's just the way it worked it's a credit to you because some people, when they get injured, and it's especially if their career is done, I mean, they go into a full scale depression. Like it's it's yeah. bad, and and some of them never never come out of it. We kind of touched on a little bit, but what? Where did you grow up? Like I, you grew up in North Carolina, but it was it a, it was a small town, right? Yes, it's a small town called Moxville. But right. when you say Moxville, people are like Tennessee, and I'm like, not Knoxville. It's called Moxville, you know. So. Right. Yeah, Moxville, yeah, Moxville, North Carolina, which is, I guess, 20, 25 minutes west of Winston-Salem. Okay, okay. And then, like, you and I have talked before, but I, I really want to kind of share it with the viewers, is that, you know, being from a small town, I mean, I'm from Poughkeepsie, which to me is a small town. Poughkeepsie is only 30,000, 35,000, at least it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, that's a small town. Yeah. And... A lot of times when people grow up in a small town, they stay there. As you and I have talked about with your family members and even extended family, most of them still live in that same town, but you you left. So obviously there was something about you. that You had some vision of a bigger bigger and better things and uh, more, more for your life. And kind of curious as to, and to share with the viewers where that came from. You know, when did it dawn on you that there was more? And then even more important, what made you think that you could achieve it and go for it? Um, I always take it back to sports, whether it was football or basketball. They forced me not to be at home. So sports took me away. And, I, and again, we didn't have a ton of money growing up. We had what we needed, but that was a, you know, nothing extra. But I seen kids that had more and they were just normal people. Right. They, they just so happened their family, you know, had a little more money or what, you know, whatever it may, a little more means or whatever it was. But then, like, when you're not around that, you think that that's not possible to achieve because it's like, well, you got to be born that way. That's the only way it works. And it's like, well, no, why can't I do that? Like, what's stopping me from doing that? You know, I can take this basketball and dribble through three people and score, you know, over the biggest guy here. Why can't I just do that with, why can't I attack life like that? The last thing I get to do is start this life over. So I can't get 60 and say, hey, I'm going to live my life now. And then, you know, say I pass at 63 and now I'm sitting here saying, man, I wish I'd have lived more life. It's like, go do it. You know, take the ball, dribble between three people and go put it in the basket. To the viewers, people like Brian don't necessarily realize that they're unusual. 
people tend to be insecure to the point where they don't try to achieve and they it's not that they're bad people they just have it kind of built in to themselves to say who am i to think that i can put out this a cd and mm -hmm. you know all these people want to record their own music and and what makes me think that i can go out to hollywood and i can write a screenplay and somebody's going to read it yeah. but you know it's if you don't that's 100 percent guaranteed that you won't be successful it would be amazing for me to never or not never but to not doubt myself to that extent to really i go for things just like i have with this show but there's always that doubt there's always that thing sitting on my shoulder just talking in my ear i've been knowing you now what five years yeah, yeah. um yeah. And like and you know me man what's the first thing i say when somebody says why what do i say why not you're not going to do anything that is going to be perfect like nobody's going to do anything that is perfect but it's never the right time it's never the wrong time to do the right thing you know um and i'll kind of circle back to my mom um and i don't want to leave it on you know a bad note or anything like that my mom was a good woman you know she had her demons just like anybody else it was a 25 year gap when I seen my mom this, until I seen my mom this uh, Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And it was 25 years, I was, yeah, I was I was 15 the last time I seen her and I'm 40. So uh, I seen my mom for the first time in 25 years this year, Mother's Day. Uh, that week, the next weekend, um, she came here. She hung out, her and, her and my sister, they came and visited and, and, and she played with the grandbabies and she, you know, seen the grandbabies for the first time and everything was all good. It made me feel like a, it was lifted off of her shoulders that she didn't owe me anything because when we did talk the, uh, on Mother's Day, I wasn't mad. I never was mad. I never was bitter. It was, never was anything like that. It was just the, 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 the little kid wanted to know what happened. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we sit down and we talked and... She told me, you know, I was caught up in some stuff. I was, you know, wasn't living right, whatever, whatever. And I always wanted to come back and see you. But, you know, one year turned to two and two turned to five and five turned to 10. And, you know, now what do you do? You know, and everybody would just say, oh, you just go see him. It ain't always that easy, you know. And um, and I told her, like, I'm not mad. I just want to know why. I said, now that you've told me that, you don't owe me anything else. You fell on the sword. You took it. And I get it. Life is tough. You know what I mean? I, I wish you had a comeback because we missed a lot of time. But you know what? We're here now. This is the way God made it to be. It's the way it's supposed to be. And soon, and we was talking on the phone and everything was good. You know, we was, everything was, she was coming back here and we we're going to see the kids again. And, you know, we was getting our relationship. And my mom passed in three months after we, you know, reconnected after 25 years. Again, you know, being that little boy who went through what he went through is just like, are you serious right now? Like, you know, that was that was different. That was different. I, I make it through a lot of things, but that was different because now this thing that was always there that shouldn't have been there was about to be fixed, you know. And, yeah. you know, never got angry with God because, you know, that's man playing and God laughs, you know. But I'm here and I'm blessed with what I have. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for what I have. I want more. Um, to just find a way to navigate through life and understand that it's not, you're not by yourself. You're not the only one dealing with a problem. And, you know, some of the people that you look at, do you think has got it all together are the people that have messed up the most? Oh, yeah. Now, one of the things, Brian, I wanted to ask you about, I just, you told me this story fairly recently, and it was really touching about your dad carrying you to the football game. And, and yeah. I really like that, if, if you're willing to tell that story. Yeah, so again, you know, growing up, we didn't, you know, my dad didn't have a car, you know, and, and he would get rides to work, you know, and wherever we needed to get to, uh, whether it was family or friends, you know, they'd come by, take us to the grocery store, whatever, but he didn't have a car. And the field was probably, I was little, so it felt like 100 miles, but in all honesty, it was probably about three, four, but I was on the train, that was on the tracks, you know, if you took the regular road, it's longer, but, you know, tracks is a straight shot. And so here I am in full gear, shoulder pads, helmet, pants, cleats, and everything. And my dad would literally carry me on his back to football games because we didn't have a car and he didn't want me to be tired going to the game. Now walking back, I walked on my own because the game was over, you know what I mean? But um, going to, he would, he would carry my helmet 
and I would just hang on his back. Now, granted, I was a little skinny kid, but at the same time, I still had on this equipment and we was walking on train tracks. And if you ever walked on tracks, it ain't the easiest thing to walk on, you know, without per a person on your back. It was also the conversations that me and him would have when we was going. And this was the, and again, this is the bond that me and him have because we would just talk about stuff. We would laugh and it would be jokes and he would completely take my mind off of the fact that we're having to walk and don't have a car because I'm just chilling with my pops, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, I'll never, I'll never ever forget that. And that's why to this day, it makes me happier to see him happy. You know, taking my dad to, we're big, we're big sports fan, you know, family, big, big sports family. We both love the Tar Heels and the, and the Panthers. And the first time I was able to take him to a football game, you know, like, and me and him just went and, and you know, he knew he was going and everything was okay. okay. And, I, and the moment when we walked out there and he seen the field and the grass and the players, like, that's big, you know, like to be able to, to, to do that for my pops, knowing that he probably not, probably would have never thought he would have been able to do that in his life. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've gone to a couple more here and there, you know, things like that. And I got some more stuff in store for him. He just don't know it yet. Anything I can do for him, it's going to be done, you know. Yeah. Like, and again, back, back to the grand scheme of things, that's what matters to me. What I, what I really get from that, too, is just children need their daddies. I see it all the time. I mean, my son, I think he's a much stronger individual because I've been very big in his life. I don't think he has some of the insecurities that I, I have. And I think it's because he has a different kind of dad. I've never tried to dominate. I would not consider myself an alpha male. I don't think I'm a wimp, you know, and I think some people mistake my kindness for weakness. And that's, I always say, you know, I am a second degree black belt. I can still kick you in the head, but I, I prefer to be kind and I, I prefer to be compassionate. And I think he's benefited from that. And I think you're, you're an example of, of, I think your confidence very much is influenced by the fact that your father played such a big role in your life. And as I've told you too, I mean, when I come over and I, and I see, you know, your oldest Serena come, come out. I mean, she just lights up when you're, when you enter the room or she enters the room with you in it. I mean, it, it is really, it is really palpable how she feels about you. And, and that just always touches me as a dad, because I think for so long, fathers kind of took a back seat, and, and I think it was just expected. But then, you know, in the last couple of generations, I've seen that men have really stepped forward and really taken on the responsibility of being a parent, not just a provider, but in, you know, actually being there and being present. You're having a really bad day, let's just say, okay? Uh, got the car trouble, you have, you go to your accounts, key people aren't there, it's Christmas time, you're trying to get those products in the store, yeah. and you're, you're on a deadline, your bonus is based on this, your boss is, 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 is up your, you know, down your throat, let's say, and, you know, just everything, uh, wife is calling, kids are sick, and you feel it, you really feel it. At some point during that day, you go, okay, Brian, enough. Yeah. How, do you, how do you get yourself out of that and back on the good foot? How do you do that? Once everything kind of slows down, I figure out, all right, what am I going to push to the side? What can wait? what can't wait, you know? So then you kind of break it down and you prioritize it that way. Because in the last, I would say four years, we, we've we started attending church regularly. That has kind of helped calm me down. See, again, like you do things and, and you kind of think, oh, I just, I just did this. And there's a process that happens in your mind and your heart and spirit before you go from A to B. So when you say, you know, I've gotten older, I've gotten more spiritual, it's like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes. How did that happen? Um, I just wanted to be better. You know what I mean? Like, it's one thing to say you want to be better, and it's one thing to truly try to be better. Um, you know, and then you give it the old adage, you know, nobody's perfect, you know, but yeah, I get that. Yeah, I'm not perfect, but I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be better. I just aspire to be, to leave this place better than it was before I got here. You know, um, teach my little brown skin girls that you can be anything you want to be in life and give them the confidence that they can be anything. Or my boys, 
my brown boys that teach them they can be anything they want to be. Like I said, just just wanting to be better kind of led to the spiritual thing. In and of itself, right? If somebody says, I'm trying to be more spiritual, that tells you right there that they're not completely in their ego, that they, they're trying to, they realize they're not the be all end all. Everything doesn't start and end with them. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you seek something, that means not necessarily that you think you're incomplete. It just means you don't think you know everything. It means you don't think you have all the answers. I think when someone says that I'm trying to be more spiritual, you know, I'm listening to certain things I didn't listen to before. I'm reading certain things I didn't read before. That shows humility. And I think it shows a lot of growth in a person. It doesn't show, I don't know something. I'm going to be honest, man. It's giving me like so much more energy to do so many more different things. Man, if you can get grounded and centered and just kind of slow everything down and just realize what matters and don't matter, a lot of other things kind of fall in place. What would you like to leave us with that maybe we haven't touched on? Anything that you feel uh, you really would like to talk about that you think might bless the audience? Um, I would, I would say to people like, find your place, find your purpose. We all have a purpose, no matter what you think, it, no matter, no matter what you think of, if you do have a purpose or not, or how small your purpose is there, ta it takes all kinds of people to make up this world, man. Like all kinds of people, somebody has to be the mechanic. Somebody has to be the chef. Somebody's got to be the president. Somebody's got to be just, everybody has a place. And your place is not right or wrong. It's just your place. And be happy with that because where you're at is where you're at. Like, that's where God put you. You didn't put yourself there. God put you there. Right. You know, in whatever moment you in, live in that moment. You know, when I was 20, I was 20. When I was 30, I was 30. I'm 40. I'm 40. Like, I'm not, you know, I wasn't 20 trying to be 40. And I'm not 40 trying to be 20. Well, I've really enjoyed having my buddy Brian on today. I think he's blessed us with his testimony and other things that he wanted to share. Continue to tune in Fridays at 4 to this program. To check out the website, www.thehopefulaspirant.com. There's a link off the website to the YouTube videos. There are t-shirts you can download off the website, as well as my new book, The Hopeful Aspirant, My Journey of Faith, and even my original book that I wrote many years ago. So thank you all for tuning in again. This is Todd Reingold, the Hopeful Aspirant. Let's all aspire to reach higher and stay inspired. God bless.